I want to speak to you today about Back to Bethel. I read an article about this man called uh, Frank Warren. What he done was he went to do a social art project in which he handed out 3,000 self-addressed stamped postcards. He handed them out to people telling them to write down their deepest secrets on this postcard. Anonymously. And then just send it back to him. Well, it wasn't long before he received 200,000 postcards back. Frank Warren. It got so bad that eventually he got in half a million postcards from people. And went to the idea that he eventually had to put it on the internet and he opened up a web page called postsecret.com. So if there's anybody up for confessions, you can go there, postsecret.com. Some of them are works of art themselves. I like this one. I always want to roll a game. Anybody else? No, it's only me and him. <laughs> I like this one here. It says, I always offer supplies because I hate my boss. I can see some of you already out. That is it's not you. Some of them are obviously very humorous and funny, beautiful words of art. Some of them are also pretty serious. A photo of Santa Claus and two boys. And uh, the caption says that, I wish my sons would talk to me. This one's a beautiful picture of praying hands. And the caption says, I want to get back to God, but I don't know how to. Pretty serious, sir. Pretty deep. Both of these postcards say the same thing. It's about getting back to somewhere. The first one is from a father's perspective. He just wants his sons to come back to him, his father. The other one, the second one, is about a lost son trying to find his way back to his heavenly father. It reminds me of the story in the Bible about the prodigal son. It's about a son who tells his father, son, I want, father, I want my inheritance, I want it now. I don't want to wait till you die. So the father gives it to him. And the prodigal son takes the money and he goes and he squanders it in a foreign land. He goes and lives up the life as a big party. All of a sudden he finds out that his money is all gone. He's got no money, so he's got to look for a job, he's got to get a job. And you know what he ends up doing? Feeding the pigs. This is a Jewish man. They wouldn't even look at a pig, never touch it. His life has dropped so low that there he is feeding pigs. It gets so bad and he's so hungry that he wishes he could even eat the food of the pigs. And in this time, he decided, no, this is it. I'm going back to my father. So in that big manure, in the hunger, in the state of pain and confusion, he gets up and he walks back to his father. You can imagine how he felt as he walked back over the hill. A bit anxious, a bit nervous, thinking, oh man, what is my father going to say? He's probably going to first beat me, and then he's going to tell me, oh, he's never going to get money again. And all this, he's walking there, he's very, very nervous, very anxious. It's kind of like when you go to the principal's office, remember that? You just don't, or when you done something bad to your wife, and you just, uh, Aubrey knows what I'm talking about, all right? <laughs> As you get that knot in your stomach, man, and he's walking over here, and he's dirty, and he's hungry, and, and he walks over the hill, and he sees his father on the porch, and he's even more nervous, he doesn't know what to expect. As he gets down the hill, his father sees him, and you know what happens? His father comes running towards him. Running towards him with everything he's got. He throws his arms around him. He hugs him and he kisses him. He takes off his beautiful robe and he puts it over that dirty boy. I can imagine my son still saying, But dad, you don't know what I've done. He says, I don't care what you've done. The son says, But dad, I wasted all your money. He says, I don't care about the money. All that I'm focused on is the fact that you are here. Back with me where you belong. And our life is Christian. We have a Heavenly Father, but so often I see that we stray off the path. We somehow get lost in the world. Sometimes intentional, sometimes we sin, and uh, we like, consciously reject God in a sense. Sometimes it's just life. Sometimes we just have children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. We've got great grandchildren here. We're not there yet. And we got jobs and promotions, and we got all this stress happening in our life. And all of a sudden, where do we find ourselves? In a foreign land, far from God. We love Him and we know Him. But that relationship is somewhat tainted. It's time today. The message is simple. God wants you to know it. it's time to come back home. It's time to come back and restore that relationship that you first had with him when you first became a Christian. Do you remember that day when you first became a Christian, that first week? Wow, it was exciting, wasn't it? You're so passionate. Oh, I want to love you and I can just do everything for you. You read like four pages of the Bible that first day, probably. <laughs> and then over time, what happened? So to read the Bible lessons, start to pray lessons. Church, nah, can't go there, I'm too busy. I've got shifts to work. 
And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in the same predicament as the sun in a foreign land. It's time for you to get up and start getting back to your father, getting back to Bethel. There's a beautiful story in the Bible that illustrates this principle. Let's turn to it in Genesis chapter 35. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Genesis chapter 35 and read the first three verses. Beautiful story about Jacob. There God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother in Esau. So Jacob said to his household, and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods who were with you, and purify yourselves, and change your clothes. And come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. Thank you, Chris. We called the story of Jacob by the end. So, we have to go right back to the beginning. Jacob was born a twin. Do you know what his twin brother was? <coughs> What's his name? Esau. And interestingly, they were Esau was born first. But right behind him, on his heel, was Jacob. Why? Because he held on to his brother's heel as he came out. Very interesting. That's what Jacob means. Literally, it means to grab hold of one's heel. Figuratively, it means to be a deceiver or a trickster. Ah oh, man, did Jacob live up to his name? It was this Jacob who tricked his brother into giving him his birthright. For what? A bowl of? A oh, soup. Oh, what are you saying? Uh, soup. A cup of soup. A royal cup of soup. <laughs> and then he went further to trick his father Isaac into giving him the blessing, the blessing that belonged to his older brother Esau. A very, very special blessing. There was no uh, funny games about blessings in the Old Testament. It was a blessing when you bless someone with prosperity and health. That is what God gave them. So when Jacob took his brother out of that blessing, you can imagine Esau was a little bit upset. I would be too. He was so upset that he threatened to kill his brother Jacob. And as you don't know much about Jacob and Esau, they were very, very different personalities. Uh, Esau was a rugged man, he was out hunting all the time, outdoors. So you can imagine he's got a dog there and a lot of hair. Right. Uh, Jacob, unfortunately, was a mommy's boy. All right. He was at home cooking and cleaning all the time. All right. That's as far as we'll go. All right. He was a real mommy's boy. So his mother was getting very uh, worried about his death threat on his house. So she went to uh, her husband Isaac and said, Isaac, listen, uh, we've got to send uh, Jacob away for a while. They didn't go find a girlfriend somewhere, you know. She didn't tell him what the real reason was. So Isaac calls him Jacob and said, Jacob, my boy, you're getting too old to stay with us. It's time to move on. It's time to get yourself a girlfriend, get yourself a mate. All the boys have been there. My Michael, you've been there. When your dad kicked you out of the house, all right? And he says, go. It's time to leave the house and find yourself a girlfriend. So yeah, Jacob goes. And he's on his way to his uncle Laban. But on route there, he stops at a place and he gets tired, the sun goes down, so he starts to lie down and sleep. And he has a dream and a vision. And this is what it was. It was a beautiful staircase from the earth up to heaven, and angels were coming down and descending and descending. And right at the top was God. And God talks to Jacob and he says to him, Jacob, I love you and I kill you. And I'm watching over you. Your descendants will be as much as the dust of the earth. He says to Jacob, Jacob, I will never ever leave you until I fulfill the purpose that I've created you. That's a beautiful, I would see God, that's what I want God to say to me first. All right? The first encounter, he's heard about God talking to Abraham and Isaac. First time ever that Jacob has an encounter with God. And it's this. Man, that is awesome. He gets up the next day, builds an altar. And he actually says in the Bible, in some translation, this is an awesome place. Man, that's how, that's how I felt when I met Jesus the first time too. It was awesome, it was excited, it was powerful. And so Jacob felt. So the next day Jacob decides, well, okay, he's still going to go on to something. So he forgets about this place, and you know what the name of this place is? Bethel. He names it Bethel. The name Bethel means house of God. Two words, Beth, Hebrew word Beth, meaning house, and Al. God. Bethel means house of God. You know what Bethel's of God? That's where it comes from. House of God. So he builds an altar and he calls it Bethel and then he goes off to go find his girlfriend. So he goes to his uncle Laban. Laban has two daughters. 
One is called Rachel and she is smoking hot. And the other one is Leah and she is dog ugly. Right? <laughs> That's what the Bible says in my own terms. Right? One was hot and one was not. And now I don't want to uh, break it to you girls. All right? Men don't look for intelligence or we don't look for human. Person. We look for good looks. All right? <laughs> so who do you think Isaac chose? And was Rachel. You see you are because she's hot. Right? And you're shallow like all other men. Right? So he sees the hot one. And falls immediately in love with her. Kind of like when you first met one that remember, wow, oh, she was hot, wasn't she? <laughs> <coughs> and he goes to Laban and says, Laban, I am so over the moon in love with your daughter. I want to marry you. So he says, okay, I'll make you a deal. If you work for me for seven years, you can marry you. Ah, so he says, all right, I'll do that. So he works and he toils and he labors for seven years. The wedding night comes, and in those days all the brides are laid over their face. So they're in the tent. Ah, this is it, the big time. So Jacob lifts up the veil to see Rachel. And it's not Rachel, it's Leah, the other sister. You can imagine what you <laughs> So he goes to Laban and says, What the hell? This is not the daughter that I want to marry. And what does Laban say? He says, oh, My bad. Normally, it's customary to be the oldest daughter at first. So, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll make a deal. All right. Marry this one, the other one, and then work for me for those seven years, and then I'll give you Rachel, the one that you want. And I don't know if he was stupid or what, but he goes for it. He falls for it, and he works for 14 years. Now, I know Bob's laughing. Can you imagine that? He worked for 14 years, and now you've got two wives to worry about. That's not a deal. <laughs> I would say, no. Take the ugly one back and just give me my right one out of here. Fourteen years later, he's got two wives. And he's still working for Laban. So he's working for family. Who works for family? Is it good working for family? Don't throw me with anything. Often, it can be tricky at times. Let me put it that way. He's working for his uncle. He's got two wives. And he starts having a big family. And between Leah and Rachel and the maid servants, they start having lots of babies. They eventually end up with twelve sons and one daughter. This begins the 12 sons of Isaac and the 12 tribes of Israel. Alright, out of this most uh, favorite one of Jacob was who was his favorite? <coughs> Joseph. Because Rachel, his most beautiful, precious wife, only gave birth to Joseph. So he loved Rachel and he really gloated over Joseph. So now he's got a big family. He's got this big family, he's got two wives for him, he's made certain and compromised for he's got the labor shouting and and in all of this confusion, remember God hasn't spoken to him all these many years. And God speaks to him for the first time. You know what God says to him? One thing. He says, Jacob, it's time to come back home. Isn't that beautiful? Just one, one sentence. Uh, has anybody heard that before? Has, it, has God ever spoken to you like that before? I'm sure he has. And all of a sudden you get busy with you and God said, whoa, Dennis, just come back home, job. It's time to come back home. That's all that God says. And Jacob hears this and says, Oh, that's it, I'm out here. So he grabs all of his belongings, all his flocks and his sheep, and his two wives, ugly one, a pretty one, all his children, and he moves back to his homeland. So he's going back home, but who is in his homeland that he should be worried about? Esau, his brother that wants to kill him. So now he's heading back home and he thinks, Oh, well, I'm not going to do this. Esau's probably going to kill me. He hasn't forgotten me. He's probably still they got unforgiveness and gratitude. He wants to kill me. So he's going there and he's thinking, man, what am I going to do? So he sends a servant. He sends one of his servants to Esau. And he says, okay, give him this message. The messenger goes to Esau and says, Esau, your brother is coming with his family and he, and he wants to live in the land of your father's land. The servant goes back to Jacob. And he says, I've given him the message, but you know what? Esau is now on his way to you with 400 soldiers. Ah, do you think Jacob was now scared? Yes, he was scared. Because now he's thinking, oh man, this is not bad news. God said, go back home, I want to come back on the time. He's still my relationship with God and my, my family. And now Esau's going to kill me. So you know what he does? I love this part about Jacob. He sees a shadow of God. What he does, he puts all his servants and his flocks out in front. Then he puts his ugly wife, second. Yeah. <laughs> his ugly wife, second, with her children. Not interested in her children. And then he puts Rachel right at the back. His hot Megan Fox, Marilyn Monroe wife. And then Joseph right at the back. And then Jacob. You see how he brings it? So first, 
he saw him kill all those people, then he killed that big wife and then two of them. And then eventually the Rabbi Yisrael Baby will cool down. So this is what happens. The entourage is happening. The caravan is walking towards Esau. Esau is coming with 400 men. So you can imagine how Esau is feeling. I don't know. But I don't know how Jacob was feeling. Pretty much scared. He was scared. He was anxious. He was just like a prodigal son. Coming home to his father thinking, oh man, this is going to be horrible. This guy's probably going to kill my family, kill me. And that's at the end of my life. God, you pulled me back here. And this is what's going to happen. So Esau starts seeing all the family. He starts walking down the soldier. See now that there's all the children, there's 12, 10 children, and the flocks and the sheep. And then he, uh, there's Rachel and uh, Joseph. Where is Jacob? And he sees Jacob. God, who done it And then Jacob sees Esau. And nobody does. He runs towards him and he bows down before him on his feet and his knees. And he says, God, oh, Jacob, please forgive me. Uh, sorry, Esau, please forgive me. And you know what Esau does? Now, if you were Esau, you could have probably just stopped in his feet. That's what I would have done. Right? Val, but you don't do that. Be Christians, Val. Come on. <laughs> Val was dancing up the storm and yesterday in the church. I thought I'd have to come and throw oil all over this church. <laughs> Esau looks at Jacob. And the most amazing thing happens. He picks him up. And he throws his arms around him. And he kisses him like imagine the tears sliding up and rolling down his cheek. He said, Jake, where have you been? We've missed you. We love you. All these years you've been gone. Wow, can you imagine how much weight was taken off of Jacob's shoulders after that? But then he says the most beautiful statement that we did while preparing. The statement that it's just it's kind of passing by, but when you read it makes so much of that. He says, When I looked at you, Esau, I could see the face of God in you. I can see the face of God in you because He has shown me grace and faith. Man, it's awesome. And you know, it just seems like nothing. It just means that He was thanking His brother. But it's deeper than that. Because in that one line, Jacob was telling us, and giving us an inclination to the very character of our Heavenly Father. And this is a parallel to the prodigal son story. Remember, the same thing happens. They come back, the father and his brother, <coughs> they're both anxious, very nervous about what's going to happen. They expect the beating stick. They expect to get shouted at, to be grounded, to be kicked, to be killed. But that's not what happens. In both cases, what happens? The father comes and throws his arm around him and forgives him for everything he's done. Esau throws his arms around his brother and says, I forgive you for everything you've done. There's no hard feelings. I love you, man. Just come back and live with us. And in the same way, that's how your heavenly father is. So many times we go and we live in a foreign land doing our own stuff. Whether it be conscious sin or whether it just be life that takes from falling. We've got so much on our plate that, you know, God starts to take a bad step. Anybody feel like that? Maybe someone today feels like that now. Maybe you've been that way for a long time. You've been so far away from God that you just don't know how to get back to you. And you think, man, when I come back to God, He's going to beat me up. I know you felt like that, don't you? Don't mean you, you can mess up so bad, you do so many things wrong. That when we come back to God, we're ashamed. We don't want to look at Him and say, God, you don't know where I've been in the last 10 years. You don't know what I've done. And God looks at you. And you know, He doesn't say, well, uh, Orbe, I'll be counting your sins in the last 10 years. And man, they look bad. Listen, Orbe, did you do this? Come on. No, He doesn't do that. God doesn't tell you, well, listen, you can come back, but I'm telling you, you're going to start right at the bottom. Oh, nothing to do with you. You've got to work yourself up. No, he doesn't say that. The God we love and serve is a God of a second chance. And he's a God of love and mercy. And when we come to him with all our mistakes, with all our problems, with all those stupid things we've done, God knows we've done them, I've done them. We come back to God and we're ashamed, we guilt with him and we feel condemned. And God looks at you and he runs towards you. He runs towards you with everything he's got. His grace will chase you down no matter where you are. The promise that God gave to Jacob was I will be with you and I will never ever leave you until I fulfill the purpose in you. So no matter where you've been today, no matter how far you've gone, I don't know where you are today, but you know, I know where you need to be. You need to be back with God. And what I love about this, it's still going on to where God tells Jacob to settle down in Bethel again. But this is important because this was a prelude to Bethel. This was about restoring the relationship back with God. Many people think they can come to church to get God. 
No, no, you get God and then you come to church. That's how it works. So first you've got to restore your relationship to God. Just like Jacob and Esau had to. You have to come to God and say, God, I'm sorry for this stuff. It's been 20 years, 10 years, it's been 10 weeks. But I'm sorry for stuffing up so badly. I'm sorry for keeping you so far away from me. Today I'm changing around, Lord, and I want to draw close to you again. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins to God, He's faithful to forgive you. And then the most beautiful part says, and He'll restore righteousness of you. God doesn't say, okay, you're forgiven, but now He's not dirty or sin to me. No! He puts His robe of righteousness on you, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how many sins you've committed. God says, I love you so much, that right now when you come back to me, you're righteous. I don't see you as a sinner. I don't see you as all those mistakes. I see you as beautiful. I see you as holy. I see you as righteous. And then after this, God says to Jacob, Jacob, I want you now to settle in Bethel. Why is that important? Because Bethel was the place where he first met God. You, you remember? The angels, the staircase. It was where he first encountered God. Where he first had that excitement and passion and the blessing and the favor. God speaking to him. God says to Jacob, go back to that place and settle there. We need to do that today. We need to restore a relationship with God. It's not about going to church and paying the tithes and being a member. To hell with all of that. It's about restoring the relationship with our Heavenly Father. You come to church as a secondary thing. Do you understand that? Church doesn't save you. Church doesn't get you to heaven. Jesus gets you into heaven. And it's about your relationship with Him that counts. So you first restore your relationship. And then you settle down. Settle down in a church, a fellowship. I don't care if it's in a mountain by the sea or right there in St. Mark's. But you settle down. And you know what I love about this? If you read the part that Tony read. Jacob goes there, but it's not by himself. Did, did you hear that he goes with his flocks and his sheep and his uh, kids and his wives and his servants? And everybody. He takes his whole family with him. Do you see that? It's not just him and uh, himself. He takes his whole family and says, No, listen. I'm going to restore my relationship, but I'm taking you guys with me. And I love that about St. Mark's. I see so many families there. I see husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, children, grandchildren. And that's what I love about it because you have decided just like Jacob. It's not about you alone. You come in here and you're going to settle down with your family. You have restored your relationship. You've made a commitment to God and say, God, I'm coming back to you. I'm not perfect. I'm still going to probably stuff up in the future. I'm going to still make mistakes. But you know what? I'm making the conscious decision that I'm going to commit my life to you again today. Can we do that today? Can we turn to God and just make a new fresh commitment to you? No matter where you've been, no matter what sins you've done, no matter how many mistakes you are living in, it doesn't matter. God's arms are wide open. And His grace is everlasting. His love is forever. No matter, there's nothing that you can ever do that can turn God away from you. Let me just tell you that right now. There's nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. When God looks at you, He sees you as a precious son and daughter of His. And yeah, you stuff up, you make mistakes, you wander off the path. But He's standing right there waiting for you to come back to Him. I read this quote. No matter what, you can overcome your past. With help, if you look to God, you can overcome your past and be reborn. It's a beautiful quote, isn't it? I know some of us are living in the past and, and it's hard to forget the, the checkered life we've been and all those bad things we've done. And you know, our past is so sordid and sometimes so horrible to even look at. I've talked to myself uh, personal experience now, not, not even about you guys. This is about me and where I've come from. And I know that I can overcome my past when I look to God. You might think, well, who said that? Probably a great preacher or a great minister. No. Anybody think I tell you that is? Don't say Rocky. Give me his real name. Sylvester so Stallone. That was said by this man. And yes, he is Rocky Balboa. He had a good upbringing. He was in a Christian home. Christian family, he went to Christian school, he was taught on the tenets of the faith, he loved God, passionate about God in the church. And then when he got into the movie acting business and all of that, he, he, he's honest and he says that he kind of straight off the path. 
And now you've got mixed up with all the fame and the fortune. And, and you know, God took a second step. And he started to just get lost in the world. And then he shocked the internet, in, entertainment industry by making the last of the Rocky series. The last chapter was called Rocky Balboa. Anybody seen that movie? Now, how you today is Rocky Balboa. All right? And he's an awesome movie. He's probably the best in the series. All right? I think about six or seven of them. Rocky Balboa is the best one. And he shocked the entertainment industry because he would bring this iconic figure back to life. They thought, you're crazy, Rocky. What are you doing? It's going to be a blunder. It wasn't. It was an awesome movie. And he said the most critical decision in making that movie was the fact that he recommitted his life to Christ. And he came back home to God. And you can see that in the movie. You can just feel the, the spiritual atmosphere of that movie. It's because he made a recommitment to God. He said, God, uh, I've done bad things. I've had so many divorces. I've, I've drank and I've probably done one or two drugs. And I've used steroids, probably. <laughs> but he said, God, I'm, I'm coming back to you. If you spoke to Jacob in the Bible and said, there's something to come back, I'm coming home. And so this is the Lord making a commitment. He said, God, I'm starting over. I'm making a new, fresh commitment to you. I love you, and I want to get back to bed. Then he made this quote. The more I go to church, and the more I turn myself over to the process of believing in, in who? In Jesus. And listening to His Word. And having Him guide me. I feel as though the pressure is off me. Well, that's an awesome quote. This is not Billy Graham. Not Joel Osteen. This is not Raymond Butler. This is Rocky. Rocky Balboa said that. If Rocky can do it, oh man, there's a lot of hope for you and I, isn't there? There's a lot of hope for the people out there that think that they're, they're too bad to come to God. There's too many mistakes in my life. I've sinned too much. No. If God can do it for this man, He can do it for you and He can do it for them. The pressure's all off him. Now why? Because he's focusing on Jesus. You see, because so often in life we get caught up with all the trappings of life. And things that get so much on our plate, doesn't it? We get to school and the kids and the cars and finances and problems. And all of a sudden our world is overflowing. The stuff is not really important, is it? He understood that. Because the pressure is off you now because he said, no, that's not my focus now. I'm taking all this stuff off my plate, God, and I'm going to focus on you. I'm making my relationship right with you. Let me tell you, if God can do it for Jacob, and He can do it for Rocky, He can do it for you. It starts by you drawing close to God. James says, draw close to God, and God will draw close to you. It's a two-way thing. I always like to see if you take one step, and God takes two steps towards you. That might help you. So when you restore your relationship with God, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done and how many sins you've committed and, and how bad you are, how many divorces you've had and all that rubbish that was in your past. It's bad and it was made. Sometimes your own decision. Sometimes it was. Sometimes other people betrayed you and hurt you. Sometimes life just got the better way. But you wake up and you find yourself in a foreign land far from God. Today's a new day for each one of you today. Wherever you are in your spiritual walk with Christ, I don't know where you are, I don't know where you are today, but I do know where you've got to get to. You've got to get back to bed. You've got to get back to where God is. And once you start on that journey back, you can look back at Rocky and say, Rocky, you don't. God's going to do it for me too. And as you do that, remember the words of Jacob. The words of God to Jacob. I will never ever leave you until I fulfill the purpose that I created you for. No matter where you are, God has never forgotten about you. He loves you. And He cares for each one of you like you were His own personal son and daughter. He loves you so much. And all He wants is you to come back to Him. To have a relationship. And I believe and declare as you do that, as you start your journey back to Bethel, you will rise to new level of your destiny. And you will become everything that God created you to be in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.